Okay, welcome to the AdaptX podcast, where we have conversations with individuals building accessible businesses, advocating for inclusion, or excelling in adaptive sports. Our intention is never to speak on behalf of those with disabilities, but provide a platform to share their ideas so we can make a more accessible world. Today, we are joined by Jocelyn Bigelow. Jocelyn is a board cert. Uh, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, analyst she's BCBA, a teacher and professional coach serving the community of persons with disabilities. From classrooms to clinics to fields, she does not accept no as an answer. Her approach to innovation in the adaptive sport world has impacted the sport of soccer nationally and globally. Jocelyn recently started a business called Say How Consulting LLC to leverage existing resources for the disability community and promote creative problem solving where resources have yet to exist. Jocelyn, thanks for joining me today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I've said it a thousand times, but struggled with it there. So uh, we'll get into all of that momentarily, but I want to start with maybe how you got into coaching in general and why you've pursued the career that you have. So what was your first introduction to disability and adaptive sports? So when I was 11 years old, which was, you know, way back in 2007, I was playing club soccer uh, for a local club in the Oregon, Portland, Gresham area. And uh, amidst the different experiences that I was having as a youth, which were not exactly positive, my mom was looking for other outlets for me because I've always had a particular passion for serving and supporting others. And the local club was starting a program called Top Soccer. I didn't really know what it was. I was just an 11-year-old being dropped off at a camp. I was told I was going to be helping as opposed to just a player. And when I got there, I was partnered with um, a young man who is slightly bigger than me. He wore glasses and he had um, Spider-Man braces on his ankles or AFOs. He was an individual who used gestures for communication as opposed to verbal expression. And for the next couple days, we worked together to play soccer. He, I distinctly remember he was not particularly interested in much of the game so I remember he and I spent a lot of time picking up and putting away equipment and kind of meandering around kicking a few balls in no purposeful direction uh, but it was an incredible experience for myself to realize how accessible and expansive the world of soccer is because I've had a very mixed and arguably negative experience in my soccer career and the one place I always find a home the one place I always find what I consider to be the true value of the game is in the top soccer setting and now in the more expansive adaptive soccer community yeah that's a really interesting point because I mean my first introduction to Special Olympics I was probably 15 and I took sports seriously but maybe put a lot of pressure on myself so there weren't always negative or there weren't always positive outcomes associated with me playing the sport individually and I was I, I don't know if I can really pinpoint it but like obsessed with coaching uh and like quickly was drawn to that but um I'm surprised because like at 11 years old that's a little young to have a lot of like perspective and understanding of stereotypes a lot of kids at that age are more so judgmental of differences can you maybe speak on behalf of why you think it was different for you or why you didn't have those same misconceptions? I think what was different for me is a um, multitude of factors. Culturally, my uh, family that I was raised around is from Oahu, Hawaii. And while I am an Oregonian born and bred, I think the cultural aspects of family and caring for the other are very much instilled in me. Uh, another factor is I experienced a lot of bullying as a youth, and um, I'm very much a fighter for other people. So when I was actually younger than 11 playing rec soccer, I was on one team where there was a girl who would likely be considered as having ADHD and maybe other um, intellectual developmental disabilities on my team. and definitely gotten some fights with my teammates about treating her nicely and one of my longtime close friends I even played a year of college ball with uh, when we were little met her on a rec team and she was wearing pink camouflage uh, hearing aids and for some reason people bullied her about that and I'm thinking those look like some dope earrings and then life went on 
Uh, so it's always just, I think, been second nature for me. And then the bullying piece, recognizing that people are treated differently for being different. And that wasn't something I wanted to perpetuate. Yeah, sports and similar interests appears to be a, a great way to bring people together. What do you think? May, this might be too broad of a question, but how do you think we can create youth and adolescents that are more receptive and understanding of disability? I feel like it's more present now, but there's still somewhat of a disconnect. I think current generations, it's more inherently instilled. I'm going to use a really random comparison, but um, you think about accessing the internet. Let's talk about Google search. Our previous generations developed alongside Google, whereas um, our younger current generations are really growing up with it. So the concept of doing a Google search is very different across the generations. This is super random, I promise I'll tie it back. Uh, I was in school and we were taught, it was a part of a lesson, it was an assignment to learn how to put things differently into a web browser to find the results that we needed. Whereas you might see uh, my, my family type in one thing and be frustrated they're not finding what they want. And then you have um, people younger than myself. I don't even know how the heck these little uh, FBI investigator type people are finding the information they are, but the CIA should be swarming with people. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. So I, I consider that um, access to information and this idea of just pushing and trying uh, until you find what you need and want is a really cool cultural aspect that's coming up in modern uh, American generations. Yeah, so a lot of programs, the ones that you are involved in now, are kind of facilitating that by putting both populations together to a degree and kind of making it normalized. Yeah, you you uh, mentioned your experience with Special Olympics. Special, Special Olympics has this awesome program for unified sport combining persons with and without disabilities together equally accessing any given sport or other kind of program together similar to best buddies and other things um it's just becoming second nature in schools we're seeing less and less of students being segregated we're still seeing the specific support students who have more complex needs need but yeah we're just making it a part of the the new culture and um when I was 14, I was a unified partner. My very first exposure to Special Olympics was a freshman in high school. I joined a community service club at my school, which was the only other club that really interested me aside from playing varsity soccer, and varsity soccer didn't give me a lot of time. When I joined this club, our first initiative was to do the Special Olympics Polar Plunge. I'm not a big uh, deep water nor cold water person, and we were jumping into the Columbia River in Oregon. So that was really intimidating, but there was this group of people older than myself saying, hey, this is fun and okay, let's do it. As time went on, I realized the leader of the movement also had a brother who accessed Special Olympics as an athlete or a person with a disability. So really starting to connect, and it turned me into this much more focused, tunnel-visioned person who just wanted to serve um, in support of helping people access anything that they really wanted to do, but of course sport, because I share that passion. Was your degree in special education? Yeah, my bachelor's is in general education, actually, in secondary education with an endorsement in language arts. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. So when I was uh, looking at getting my degree, I would started in psychology and wanted to have something what, that I felt had more bulk to it, um, more direct impact on the community I wanted to serve. But when I was looking into schools like Portland State and Concordia, I didn't know what I didn't know. I wanted to go into special education, and I was told by both schools, oh, you can't do SPED as a bachelor's, it's only a master's. What I didn't realize and what I didn't know to ask was, oh, you don't have that, but I could have done that elsewhere. So um, 
All that to say, I actually like that I have the gen ed background. It allows me to be more versatile. My master's is through Portland State. It is a special education master's. However, it's focused in applied behavioral analysis, as well as I have a certificate in autism spectrum disorder. Yeah, I started with special education as well. And my, I think, initial vision as an 18-year-old was to end up back at my high school, like, uh, teaching the athletes that were in my Special Olympics program. Like, I, I really just wanted to continue to be a part of their lives. And I, I found a, a different way to do so that allowed me to be a little more active. But um, last month, you were recognized by U.S. Soccer with the annual Adapt and Thrive Disability Award, as well as the Carla Overbeck Leadership Award. Uh, the first recognizes an individual is making an impact in the U.S.'s broad landscape of disability soccer. Um, what did those mean to you, and were they on your radar prior to receiving them? So that's an interesting question. The Adapt and Thrive Leadership Award uh, was a nomination process. There were three public nominees for that uh, award to be voted on by the general public, and that was myself, a gentleman from Top Soccer uh, elsewhere in the country, and MLS Works, which is MLS's, I believe, nonprofit charitable foundation entity. I actually have had the opportunity to work with MLS Works when I co coached uh, the MLS Unified All Star Game this past summer in Washington, D.C., West Coast One. Go West Coast, first time in four years. What? <laughs> Sorry, East Coast. Anyway, um, we. <laughs> uh, that award was on my radar because uh, two, one or two years prior, I was a part of helping develop that concept of the award. It was not my idea. All the credit goes to our friends at United, or, uh, U.S. Soccer's Extended National Teams Department. But as the leader of the Adapt and Thrive Working Group that I'll talk about later, and a part of the Disability Soccer Committee through U.S. Soccer, we contribute a lot to these different um, movements acknowledging adaptive progress in soccer in the American landscape. So that award was created. This was the third annual award, previously won again by top soccer coaches Sandy Castillo and Sean Danhauser, two really good um, peers and mentors of mine. So it was on my radar in that regard, but I had no idea I was going to be nominated. So that was kind of surreal and uh, I really value that it's voted on by the soccer community because if what I'm doing isn't almost worthy of recognition then I'm clearly not representing the public in the way I should be. So uh, that was a really stellar uh, recognition of my efforts and a reminder to keep moving the Carla Overbeck Award, I found out in January, I was on a Zoom call with uh, U.S. Soccer's President Cindy Parlo Cohn, uh, preparing to talk about this next year for how we're going to be developing adaptive soccer, especially going into some major events coming in the next few years. And all of a sudden, joining our Zoom call, aside from her precious little boy, was Carla Overbeck. Uh, Previously, Carla Worden, she was the captain and a major player in the U.S. Women's National Team in the 90s and continues to be a prominent figurehead in soccer as the coach for Duke. Uh, this award is not female-specific. It just happens to be named after a woman. It's a second annual award. Uh, I'm the second annual awardee. I sat in the ceremony last year watching the first awardee get their award and thinking, wow, that is so cool. So to get that this year was really amazing. And I accepted that award this past weekend at the U.S. Soccer Annual General Meeting for 2024. And I started off my speech, and I'll conclude my soapbox rant here, of the awards that I've received recently focus on me but truly I want to redirect the focus on the individuals that I collaborate with to get the work done and the individuals that we're serving, not just players, but also coaches, officials, fans, and more with disabilities or serving the disability community. Yeah, that's been such a hard thing to navigate for me personally as well as like getting recognition. Obviously, when people see inclusion and disability, there's a, a visceral positive reaction. Uh, they do feel moved in some way. 
but like I'll share something of one of my clients at the gym accomplishing something great. And the comments will be like, oh, it's so great that you create that gym for them. And I'm like, wait, that's not <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to like showcase is I'm like that. That's not the idea. So it's it's sometimes tough to be in this space because you you do get so much praise. And like to me, my initial experiences with Special Olympics helped me way more than they probably helped the athletes. And it's just kind of always felt that way to me. Like this has been an awesome career. It's been incredibly rewarding it's in many ways kept my life on uh, a good trajectory and a good path. And to be like praised for that seems, seems weird, but that could probably be a whole nother conversation. You mentioned on that, on that call that you were kind of highlighting uh, maybe the next year of work or what your goals are for the, for the uh, foreseeable future. Um, anything specific that you can kind of highlight or identify. So in my niche role serving U S soccer and the adapt and, Thrive uh, Working Group and the Disability Soccer Committee, really just the adaptive soccer movement as a whole. Um, we are going to have a shift in leadership, but not a shift in progress with our volunteer groups. The great part of being a part of these volunteer groups with U.S. Soccer, like the DSC or the Adapt and Thrive Working Group, is there's less bureaucratic processes so we really can push the envelope and try different things and get the word out there for example you can see some of the tangible products we've worked on in the past that we update annually on our website unitedadaptivesoccer.com that is representative of United Adaptive Soccer Association an association composed of eight of the nine formal disability soccer organizations that are members of U.S. soccer currently. Eight of those organizations came together to apply for a grant through U.S. soccer because U.S. soccer doesn't just dish out money to its members. There's a formal process so as to ensure that we're holding ourselves accountable and acting in the best image of the crest. And the Innovate to Grow grant fund um, we earned as a collective group and we're using that to further spread awareness and create more meaningful functional opportunities for athletes and coaches so that we can start to contribute to better quality programming. So the moral of the story is going into this next year, I have a particular passion for language, which we could talk about later. We'll be updating our modern language document housed on unitedadaptivesoccer.com as well as an interactive map of where all of our disability soccer organizations are throughout the U.S. We will also be creating uh, documentation for best practices, actually inspired by my colleagues at Move United, best practices for how to conduct meetings and presentations through U.S. soccer, and we'll make that suggestion to U.S. soccer. Another uh, product we'll have in the next couple months is brief one-page type materials for other U.S. soccer member groups pertaining to how to better align with the adaptive soccer movement, whether that's intentionally adding the language of disability to their non-discrimination policies, um, advertising specifically that persons with disabilities are also welcome, saying any ability sometimes um, are Persons with disabilities don't see themselves in any ability. And then uh, the biggest thing we're going to be contributing to is coach education alongside the formal extended national teams department with U.S. soccer. We'll be looking to influence getting persons with disabilities educated and educating all of our coaches, regardless of ability, on how to be more inclusive minded. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. Those are those are all topics that I kind of had on my radar that I want to talk about, the disability language and the interactive map and all that stuff. Extended national teams, there's currently nine, five, ca five categories, men, women, and one that's co-ed, I think, right? Yeah, so there's, um, in the extended national teams department, these teams are the same as the senior national teams, the Christian Pulisic and the Alex, Morgan, Alex Morgans of the world. Those senior national teams, there's actually in U.S. soccer 27 different national teams because you have the senior, 
you have several levels of youth national teams, and then you have the extended national teams, which incorporates different playing pathways such as beach soccer, futsal, which is my personal favorite, and then to play, to be clear. My, my uh, adaptive soccer teams are still my favorite favorite. And then we have five specific to persons with disabilities national teams. Those five are men's and women's deaf soccer, men's and women's CP soccer or cerebral palsy soccer, and uh, co-ed power soccer for persons using power wheelchairs. And hopefully uh, we had Nico Calabria, who's the captain of the U.S. AMP soccer team on the podcast, who I'm friendly with. He's come out to the gym uh, to record some stuff with us. Uh, he said they're in the process of hopefully maybe becoming one of those or that it's kind of a lengthy, lengthy process. But So like I said, U.S. soccer is really very much about the movement but like anywhere else you go in the general population, some of our peers without disabilities need kind of need a Shark Tank model. Bring the product to them, give them a clean, succinct presentation, and they'll absorb our efforts. And that's why U.S. Soccer has these volunteer groups that don't have to uh, function through a lot of red tape so that we can explore what is best representative of the public and what's most useful. So as we're talking about membership, that is distinctly a U.S. soccer function. Uh, there's three levels of membership specifically for disability service organizations, DSOs as they're called in U.S. soccer. Tier three is where all of our badges exist. We have Amputee Soccer, American Youth Soccer uh, Organization, EPIC, Blind Soccer, CP Soccer, Deaf Soccer, Down Syndrome Futsal, Dwarf Soccer is working on their membership, Power Soccer, now Special Olympics North America, and then USU Soccer's Top Soccer. So that's, that's actually 10 organizations, one of which is still pending membership. Uh, amputee Soccer, for example, as I understand it, they are hoping to achieve Tier 1 status as a member in the coming years. Tier 1 is what CP, DEF, and POWER have achieved. They still have Tier 3, which is essentially their grassroots or developmental model. And then Tier 1 is just their senior national teams. And rather than the nonprofit that started it, managing it, U.S. Soccer absorbs it and manages that team. So some of the prerequisites include having both uh, uh, fully inclusive gender identity pathways. So amputee soccer is developing their women's pathway to be eligible to apply, um, among other things that we're required to do to align. But yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing Nico Calabria and Jovan Booker and uh, my personal uh, close friend, Alexia McKeady, gracing the men's and women's fields for U.S. soccer in the near future. She was, she goes to Ithaca, right? Does she play soccer at Ithaca? Yeah. Yeah, she was playing for Ithaca. She, I believe she's moved to a different school. Um, I don't want to speak for her. I know that she is traveling abroad right now, uh, learning abroad. So she's doing incredible things. So definitely a person to watch. On yeah. When, when I talked to Nico, kind of the conversation was like the path to profitability and sustainability and because he wants to transition into making it kind of his full time career. Um, and we, we just kind of talked about what that route looks like. Um, so kind of like you said, Shark Tank sort of thing, like it can be as well intentioned as possible, but there also has to be a direction to make it sustainable and kind of have standards. Um, so. He, I know he's putting a lot of work into getting it there. Uh, what was the what was the process like for you developing um, the Down Syndrome football program? Down Down Syndrome Sports of America uh, approached U.S. Soccer in 2021, saying that they wanted to build a Down Syndrome national team or a national team for players with Down Syndrome. Just to preface, I do default to person first language as much as possible, but in our soccer pathways, we're used. Uh, it's very commonplace because that's the title of the organization to proceed with disability than soccer. Anyway, um, DSSA uh, came to U.S. Soccer saying, hey, we want to do this. U.S. Soccer passed it. 
down the chain to the volunteer organizations who can have more of those functional conversations and help the development of that program. So Kelly Trevor, one of the co-founders of DSSA, met with one of my mentors and colleagues, Ashley Hammond of CP Soccer, who uh, was and is stepping down soon as chair from the Disability Soccer Committee. Uh, basically saying, hey, we want to do this, we just don't, we, we need some help to get started and to develop. And I have a particular vested interest in serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, done so in the classroom, in clinics, in the community, and of course on the pitch. So it just made sense. So I joined their team as head coach and have supported the development of their soccer slash futsal environment. Futsal is a five-a-side street soccer, so it's played on a textured court in an ideal world with a slightly smaller weighted ball, and it does have out-of-bounds on like indoor soccer, and uh, it's just the best sport. It's so great. Um, all about technique, footwork, speed is a part of it, but not the entirety of it, which is really great for our athletes with Down syndrome. Now, I also want to note scheduled soccer programming. These are just further opportunities for eligible individuals to play. Our athletes with Down syndrome are deeply involved in top soccer, in EPIC, in Special Olympics. However, when you put athletes with varying intellectual and developmental disabilities on the same pitch, you'll see a variation in ability. Athletes with Down syndrome have not only cognitive impact, but also physical uh, symptoms of their disability. So the Down Syndrome Sports of America just wanted to create a pathway even more geared towards specifically the population of athletes with Down Syndrome to level the playing field. Yeah, the whole, um, I guess, concept of creating inclusive programs, people with and without disabilities seamlessly existing versus, um, I don't know what a better word for it would be, versus, as a, like, other than like exclusive, so like only athletes with Down Syndrome on the pitch there there's advantages from a performance standpoint for those athletes to maybe feel more successful what have been or why do you think the ssa was initially started instead of because i was reading a little bit about that it was some parents that want to get their um their children involved um why do you think they went that path instead of just have them involved with like Special Olympics or a pre-existing program? I'm going to speculate, so I just want to be clear that I'm not meaning to speak for those incredible families who started DSSA. My perspective is our athletes with Down syndrome, for example, are have a unique disability category. That is also a spectrum. And a lot of times if you put them on the same playing field as say a person with autism spectrum disorder around the same developmental level, the person with ASD is gonna move faster, potentially process faster, et cetera. So I think the founders of DSSA truly wanted a level um, fair playing field for people with Down syndrome and with like-minded humans who understand that specific disability category. I know that one of my athletes, Caitlin Trevor, she is a female on our co-ed national futsal team. Incredibly well-spoken, just a great athlete. So impressed by her constantly. She's doing all the sports, all the things. And it's a testament to how true advocacy can be effective because sometimes our athletes with Down syndrome get quote unquote left in the dust. When you talk about persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities, one of my personal frustrations is only offering them individual sports like swimming and track and field. They participate very well. However, coaching a team sport with people who all learn differently is tough. So I was just all about their mission and I align with the concept that there is an appropriate way to have um, distinct pathways. And kind of going back to all of our badges, as I call them, all of our DSOs, Three of those DSOs have recreation at their core. Top soccer, epic, and special Olympics. Participation, just an opportunity to get out there. Special Olympics and the rest of our badges also offer more development, meeting the player where they're at, but now starting to push towards the soccer model that we want to see. And then we have those five extended national teams and our other DSOs that are developing their national teams. 
because it's not just about participation. We're past that point. We're at a point, as, as you know, as a disability community, where we also deserve to play at the highest levels. Carson Pickett's a great example of an athlete who's played in the mainstream pathway, frankly, Alexia McKeevy as well, um, to train amongst their peers without disabilities and be pushed in the same way and held to the same expectation. Yeah, that last piece of expectations has always been big for me. Like we're, we're applying for a grant uh, due on Friday for a research project on high intensity training for individuals with Down. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's mostly done at this point, but uh, high intensity training for people with Down syndrome, um, how well they can respond to it, uh, whether it's more effective than lower and moderate intensity. And we've shared, we've shared the premise of the study with a lot of Down syndrome researchers and uh, frankly, some of them have like really low expectations for people with Down syndrome. Uh, we have a lot of people with Down syndrome at our gym, so I see the spectrum. We got some people that it's a challenge to get them consistently moving with intent and intensity, but there's also people with Down syndrome who are deadlifting a lot of weight, squatting a lot of weight, and they're really strong and uh, very eager, very eager to be active. So to make a gross generalization, like all people with disabilities exercise at a low intensity seems a little. Um, unfortunate to me. Uh, so it, it's been interesting to talk to some, th uh, some people that are like only in the research space. Uh, so they just kind of live only in the literature as opposed to in the lived experience. Uh, so that's where I guess that's kind of where my role is. I'm not, I'm not one of the principal investigators, but I'm the one that's going to be providing the facility and providing the training for the athletes and stuff. So that, that's interesting to me. I think on that whole premise of like, whether there needs to be programs for specific diagnoses. Uh, I'm sure as you would agree, as long as there's options for them to participate in kind of whatever environment they're most comfortable and feel most successful. And that's, that's kind of what inclusion is, I guess, the opportunity to choose. Yeah. Right. I think um, a point of interest for me is all of these organizations, I'd venture a guess started with a parent or somebody with a loved one who just deserved more and deserved better. And it's blossomed into a lifestyle, a mindset. And I'm just, I'm grateful to all of our founders, to all the people that drive the game and drive access because this isn't exclusive to the pitch. We're just in a soccer based conversation right now. Yeah, absolutely. How do you apply your work as a BCBA to coaching? That's a great question. So um, as a BCBA, I, uh, represent the applied behavior analysis field and ABA has kind of a bad taste in some people's mouths, especially in the intellectual and developmental disability community. Some things we're guilty of as BCBAs is being incredibly pretentious, uh, using vernacular that isn't accessible to uh, the different clientele and populations that we're working with. In addition, we like to hear ourselves talk, as you can tell. So um, there, there's some couple things, but also we believe that all behavior is communication. We believe that behavior can be shaped, but I wanna be very clear that when I apply my ABA uh, fundamental practices, that I believe I can influence behavior, but I do not believe that I can change behavior because the only thing I can control is myself <laughs> oh my goodness, I don't have that down. But yeah, so as far as applying ABA to the sports field, uh, it's really it's really rooted in the ABCs, antecedent behavior consequence. What happens immediately before, during, and after a behavioral event? And if all behavior is communication and all behavior is everything we do, kicking a ball is a behavior. Coach delivers the cue, kick. They kick, we say nice kick. Sometimes we say unlucky and I don't know how much of anything is truly luck, but um, the, the structure and the reinforcement principles of ABA are highly valuable and highly needed in sports training at the lowest and the highest levels of performance. I think that our um, highest levels of performance in U.S. soccer, our C license, B license, A license coach, really get some of those principles without knowing they're doing that. Um, they, then again, 
we have athletes that leave the sports because they're not feeling motivated, engaged, and reinforced in their efforts. And unfortunately for a lot of our staff, it's hard to hear, oh, you need to change what you're doing, but more or less, we all have the power to influence behavior, so how can we influence not only how we coach, but also how they receive information and self-manage? Um, as a school-based BCBA, currently I have a contract with a local, very small rural school district, and it's interesting. ABA, again, doesn't have a great taste in Oregonian mouths. I know a lot of incredible BCBAs in the school systems and in clinics where I started. And I try to be careful not to push the scientific pieces. It's just data driven. Soccer um, is very much data driven nowadays. So, so is education, so on and so forth. It's really how we make those best decisions. I know you're gonna be intimately familiar with the grant that you're applying for and the projects you're pursuing. Um, the the r basic summation is using data-driven and evidence-based practice to be effective in the various roles is how I apply my being a BCBA. Yeah, absolutely. So all behaviors have a function, whether they're positive or negative. Uh, maybe it's someone regulating themselves, or I think the issue that I've read about in the ABA space is just defining what's acceptable for behavior or trying to fit everyone into one like mold i guess but this this idea that especially in the aba field that we expect people to act a certain way is a fundamental misunderstanding applied behavior analysis publishes or like the aba field has all these concepts and theories of practice to implement positive change for our clients it's all individualized. We have basic recommendations for best practice. We, we say hello, but we don't always say the word hi to every single person. We might change the words we use, our inflection, our delivery based on context, learning our supports to the individual. An example of a stereotype in ABA is we try to train auditory, or I'm sorry, oral, um, stereotypical behaviors for persons with autism spectrum disorder that are prone to repetitive sound making that we just don't do that no somewhere along the line somebody didn't communicate effectively and maybe instituted principles or said something that was discriminatory towards um the verbal stereo stereotypes with people with asd but that's truly not the case more than likely for that one individual, those verbal stereotypes were really interrupting maybe their academic environment or making it hard for them to get employed or it was interrupting their ability to advocate for themselves with their doctor. So a BCBA was brought in to help uh, influence, not necessarily change that behavior. Um, so that being said, everything is tailored to the individual. There are things that can be generalized across people, places, and things. However, no matter what, we all are meant to go into it. Each context is unique, each person. Yeah, we can kind of apply that systems of reward and reinforcement, um, even informally within the gym or with coaching. Um, usually that first session, with a new client is just kind of identifying uh, identifying those ABCs, like what exercises were they motivated to do? Which ones did they enjoy? If they responded negatively to it, what was the antecedent before that? How, how can I like maybe structure it in a way where it's present the challenge to the individual, give them something they enjoy as a reward, present the challenge, give them something they enjoy as a reward. Um, so you kind of you kind of inform yeah you just informally kind of do that but I think that's one way where working with people with disabilities or kind of having my special ed background um, made me more effective as a coach is just like I inher I kind of inherently like adopted those things and we were working with athletes who were nonverbal or um, non speaking I know there's there's different ways to communicate that now um, and we, and when you learn to communicate with someone who does so differently, it, it makes you a much better communicator for all people. 
Uh, maybe continuing on the topic of language and communication a little bit, you helped develop U.S. Soccer's first modern language document pertaining to disability language. You know, the landscape of language and etiquette, uh, etiquette seems to always be evolving person first versus identity first. And it seems to be very individualized, but like what, what um, maybe what were the key takeaways as you were developing that document and how did you go about doing so? I do want to just go back to how much I appreciate your introduction to Adapt X in that it's meant to represent and support the community of persons with disabilities, but not to speak for any one person. And that's essentially what the modern language document or the MLD is all about. U.S. Soccer recognizes it, however, it was um, composed and put out into the <laughs> world at large by the Disability Soccer Committee and our colleague Josh Pate, Dr. Pate, who um, is a researcher uh, within disability sports and language and all that. So it's an evidence-driven document that's meant to give suggestions for best practice when talking to and about people with disabilities. You'll notice I'm saying people, not athletes, because I'm trying to generalize more of my language from now on to include our coaches, officials, fans, etc. cetera. Uh, the modern language document is, is reviewed annually, in the summer more so, by all of our disability soccer organization member groups uh, representing their own pathway. So um, a person from dwarf, dwarf soccer might look at the document and say, it's okay to say dwarf in this context, uh, default to little person, um, small stature, however. And then you'll have um, persons in the deaf, hard of hearing, or um, who are blind, visually impaired, letting you know, hey, here's what's current in our space. So there's the informal input of the DS and some of our other colleagues to look at modern literature and ensure that we are kind of covering our bases. It's just suggestions. The number one suggestion is always to default to person first. The number two suggestion, which really should be the number one going into this next year is, is it even necessary to label disability? I will say too, regarding the word disability, uh, Disability isn't a bad word, our inter, inter, international federation, um, to differentiate para from disability because para is owned by Paralympics and we don't want to um, contaminate or like cross over on branding. So disability was um, put out by FIFA in 2022 as their official language to describe that pathway. However, I think there are movements within the U.S. landscape that will have us moving more towards adaptive because the soccer itself is not disability. It's adaptive. It's laden with different models that have accommodations or modifications to the traditional game. Yeah, I think etiquette and communication, some of the ambiguity associated with it is is one of the things that is a big barrier for a lot of people in terms of interacting with disability. It's almost been ingrained since you were a younger kid to not stare at the individual with a wheelchair, don't say something that would offend them, and then it just kind of perpetuates this narrative of don't talk to someone who looks different than you. Well, Jocelyn, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk today. Congratulations on all the success. I know it, it might get recognized in a small segment of time, but it's the consolidation of a lot of years of work. So um, I hope you're, you're proud of the accomplishments. And again, thanks for uh, sharing your expertise. Thank you for listening to the AdaptX podcast. Our effort to amplify the ideas of our guests and create more inclusive and accessible industries is futile unless these episodes reach a larger audience. If you enjoyed our discussion today, please leave us a rating or a review on whichever platform you use. And if you would like to learn more about Adaptex, the course that we teach to health and fitness professionals and the projects that our organization is working on, you can subscribe to our newsletter through our website, www.adaptex.org. Until next Monday.